Um, so we're going to start lightning talks. And uh, if you organize a conference, you can go first. So uh, Dean uh, had to leave, so I'm going to do a talk as Dean's talk. Hi, I'm Dean Hudson. I go by Dean the Arrow. Um, So I'm Dean Hudson, I'm my Dean Hero on Twitter, I look like this, I work for Sub Pop. Um, Shane and Ben asked me to give some music for the party, so uh, I did, and uh, I'm a nerd, so I wrote a shell script and gave it to him in gist, and it's about 16 hours worth of music from our S3 account, uh, that's the URL, which is hard to remember, so Shane made a redirect URL, um, and you all can go download that music, not right now. Um, so just save that URL and there's 16 hours of awesome sub pop changes. Right, also, this is what a, um, um, a ladle looks like that can be used by anyone. Uh, I'm just saying. Okay. Hey guys, I'm here. So I actually talked yesterday. This can be quick. So, so yeah, I'm just going to pimp a library that I wrote, which was. It's called Kiachi, which is supposed to be Japanese for catch. Take that with a grain of salt. Um, it's uh, basically a port of uh, a really, really excellent Ruby tool. It's, it's a dev tool that someone wrote called Mailcatcher. I don't know if you guys read, uh, read about it. Basically, you set it up. It's a local SMTP server, essentially. Um, and so if you're a local Rails development, or actually any development, um, you can just have all your emails go to this one nice little web app uh, inbox, and you can see the HTML plain text and the source, and you can download it. It's really cool. It comes in handy as a tool. So, heeding on the advice, I think that someone said yesterday, hey, if you see something, see if you can write in something else. Um, so this was written using that machine and Ruby, and it was great. I was like, yeah, this sounds like a cool project, a cool Node uh, project. So I rewrote it for Node, uh, ported it to Node, it's called Catchy, it's a open source, it's on GitHub, and uh, just Quick little demonstration, so this is it, and I just wrote, <laughs> I'm using a little Ruby. Surprisingly, writing mail in JavaScript is hard. The mail gem that we have in the Rails world is super freaking awesome, so be happy about that. So yeah, I don't know if you saw there was a little ground notification, and uh, yeah, it comes in here. So yeah, like I said yesterday, you know, don't be monogamous, so play around and uh, have fun. Hello, I'm Dave, this is Adam. I met many of you last night, and I apologize. Uh, we work for Substantial, and we want to tell you about a tool that we built, and we'd like to share it with you, and uh, maybe you'd be interested in it as well. Anyone care to try to pronounce this? No. Yes. This is an Alphys, the never knew code analysis tool. <laughs> It's a professional twice over. Uh, you can go to the GitHub repo, we have a link to a video. Basically, it uh, uses some gems to do code metrics over time. Basically, read plus flog over Git. It uses uh, the same uh, syntax you're used to for navigating the Git graph. Um, and uh, it runs in Ruby 1.9. Um, how do you get it? You guys have seen this before. Uh, my computer is called Strudel. Um, I don't know why. Uh, how do I run it? You might ask. <laughs> well, you just type in Elphys. And uh, if you don't give it any arguments, uh, it will just run against basically whatever your current probably topic branch is, and it'll run against uh, Origin Master. Um, or, optionally, you can give it a git name, or a, a revision by name, a SHA, um, or any one of those sort of ref uh, finder syntax uh, phrases. All right, so this is probably a little hard, at, uh, a little hard to see. It's small, but um, just an example of the analogist output. Total score lower is better, like golf. Shows new problems. These are problems that have been introduced since whatever the previous revision is that you're diffing against. So in this case, we're diffing analogists uh, version zero point four. Uh, versus six commits before that for whatever reason, because it makes a nice output. Um, 
Then we'll also see problems that were removed or solved, uh, basically code that was made better by uh, the metrics of reek and flog. Uh, and Outfist itself is actually just a glorified script, so it couldn't do anything that it does without uh, two awesome tools, reek and flog. Um, Ryan, I'm sure, can tell you about flog, and reek is also something awesome that you should check out. So we've got, a, we're, we're, we're trying to make uh, an element better. There's a few things that uh, we could do right now. It just runs against app and lib. It would be nice if we could you know, tell it run against this folder or that folder. Um, if we could use things like uh, Rails with practices or any sort of other uh, metrics we could get. Um, the scoring right now is fairly arbitrary. Um, adding plugins, output formats. Um, and even better would be having other people help us build this thing. Um, so that's pretty much it, uh, like lightning, what just happened. Um, now we're going to go dig a hole and put some rice in the water. Yeah. <laughs> so we're hiring. Thanks, guys. So um, I'm here to talk to you about, shoot, showing you my first slide. It's not what I wanted. Not what I wanted at all. I'm really good at keynote. Super presenter just went, all right, screw it. All right, so uh, short and somewhat accurate history of this thing that we're doing right now. I'm Ben, um, I do stuff. You may remember me from such conferences as this conference. <laughs> uh, once upon a time, there were these guys. Uh, they were in some states south of here. Uh, and they thought, you know what, we should have a conference. We should totally do this conference. We can get people from Oregon and Washington and maybe California, but screw those guys, to come and uh, hang out and we'll talk about Ruby and maybe we'll drink some beer, maybe we'll have a really good time. And uh, so they put this whole thing together and it was called, uh, well, it was a great idea, and it was called Ruby on Ants. So later, uh, in San Francisco, there were two other guys from some other states, uh, you know, not Oregon, because, well, I love Oregon, but screw it anyway. Um, and uh, this happened. Um, I said, I want to do a comp, and Shane said, hey, Go Get Rico is really cool, right? And I was like, yeah, totes. And uh, so we decided to copy it, but to do it up here, because um, it's, you know, not San Francisco. All right, cool. So, some time passed. And uh, I'm talking, like, months. A lot. Yeah, and uh, we slacked off uh, quite a lot. And uh, then it was March. And, uh, well, come March, time to get some shit done. So, got a venue, locked down all the sponsors, <laughs> planned a party, and wow, this is really damn hard. So, um, I want to take a moment because I want to show you uh, what got me, well, yeah, I'll, just, I'll explain. So this is Karn, you may recognize her from the registration desk. Uh, she's doing a face here, this, um, I'll get to it in a second, but uh, she's eating, you know those sushi kits that came out recently that you like make your own sushi candy? They're gross as hell, do not try. <laughs> they will make you make that face. <laughs> this face. <laughs> the official emote condom cascading for the 2011. <laughs> Venue? Squinty face. Oh, by the way, this comes with a noise. It's ah! <laughs> Contracts? Ah! <laughs> Money? Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> My face turns those colors. So suddenly, I get this alert. Blur's Day, that's when we go drink beer. Um, and this, here's my calendar. Uh, it's now, I mean, this is on Thursday, when my alarm goes off, I'm like, oh shit, it's Blur's Day, I'm out of time. Conference starts in 15 hours. I should point out, if I didn't already, this is my experience, this was not Shane's, I'll let him tell you this. So I got 15 hours left, what am I gonna do? This. I was also making the face the whole time, but I couldn't really fit it on the slide. So hold on a second. You know what? There's nothing else I can do. I'm done. I'm not done, but I can't change anything. It's inevitable. So all that happened. Fast forward to tomorrow when we start planning this next year. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So I'm going to talk about my awesome house. And in my house, I have many labor-saving devices. I've got some washing machines. Not right. Uh, I've got a dishwasher, I've got a microwave, uh, i got an oven, but it's gas and, and convection though. 
Um, but it's also the future, and uh, we've got cool things in the future. We've got robot cars, we've got pocket computers, and we have network lights, which is. <coughs> and so you may be thinking, you know, like X10, no, that stuff is crap. I use Insteon, and so they got these switches and dimmer things, they got control pads. We got IO kits. This is uh, I, I put this up in my garage door so I can open and close it wherever. And if it's open for too long, it goes and says, "Hey, I'm still open." Uh, we got outlets, and And so to control all this stuff, um, I use this software called Indigo. It's made by Perceptive Automation. Uh, this is uh, a bunch of all the switches in my house and other stuff. Got a fireplace up there. Notice the toilet is on the list. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the toilet light switch. Um, you can set up scenes in this. So uh, this is a scene to turn off all the lights that are not upstairs. So when I go to bed, that turns them all off. You can also set up like I want it a little bit on for some mood lighting. You can do triggers. Uh, I copied this. I don't have a hot tub. This guy's got a hot tub, so you can email his hot tub and have it warm up. And it's going <laughs> uh, this other guy has a lawn. I don't have a lawn, so he's got a sprinkler. And then there's also with the Indigo software, there's an iPhone app, so I can, you know, I got my, I can go and change lights in my house. Um, and so I am a lazy person, and so you know, like when I'm watching TV, I don't want to go fiddle with dimmers, so I got a thing for that. Uh, when I go to take a shower, I want the fan to turn on and then turn off after I'm done. And if it's dark, I want the lights to turn on, so I've got all that stuff. Um, if you, know, you burn something in the kitchen, you can turn all the fans on and vent stuff. Uh, you can turn on the fireplace from like the driving home. It's going to be cold. Turn the fireplace on. And then, you know, one for bedtime, so you can turn everything else then off that I, that I don't want to do. But there's still some stuff that I don't have set up right, I still want to do. Um, I don't have a thermostat for the fireplace, so I've got all this stuff. And uh, one of these days when I'm done going to conferences, I'm going to actually figure out how to stick the pieces together. Um, I've got a receiver, so uh, Indigo can also control iTunes. So I'm going to set that up to go and say, hey, turn on my receiver, set it to the AirTunes thing, and, uh, you know, set the volume right so we can play stuff. Uh, alarm integration, so it'll better know when I come and go. Uh, so I can turn on lights if I get home and, you know, dark out. Um, and then also uh, do some watering. So I've got some balconies. and. Uh, Want to go and have like a little bucket, and an aquarium pump, and then there's outlet controller so you can go and water the plants that you don't have to go and carry the, the watering can around and everything. And so uh, I bought all the stuff at my home store. They got great customer service, and the uh, control stuff is at Perceptive Automation. So if you want to know anything else about that, you can ask me. Thank you. Hi, I haven't rehearsed this at all. <laughs> Hold on. So today, Rich and I were doing some calculations at lunch. Yes. <laughs> I've just wasted $60. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. I work for a company called ATT. Uh, my title there is Senior Software Engineer. <laughs> yeah, please steal this joke. You're allowed to use it, but with a word of warning is it doesn't work in foreign countries. <laughs> Some foreign countries, it, it doesn't translate in Japan, and if you say it in a Spanish-speaking country, they just think you're Mr. Software. <laughs> uh, you can find me on the internet as at Tenderlove. Um, Ebby, my fiance, says that everybody needs to have their uh, Twitter avatars put on their badges because you can't recognize anybody. So if you see me on the internet, this is this is what I look like on the internet. <laughs> And that, I don't actually have a bullet that is a wig. Um, I wanted to point out something about the Cascadia Review Pump website that I really like, is if you highlight all of these, they turn pink. It's beautiful. I don't know if Shane did that on purpose or not, but I love it. Um, so, oh my God, three minutes. So they asked for honest feedback, and I noticed a trend throughout the talks today that we're all like talking about our feelings. And I want to talk about ladles. <laughs> so, I've got, a couple, I've got a couple ladles up here, but first we need to talk about the history of ladles. <laughs> uh, time, right? First, the ladle was invented, and then as we move forward through time, America was invented. And then, at the end of that, um, after America was invented, being left-handed was invented. <laughs> 
Now, the thing is, ladles, ladles came from Europe, and they, they were invented in the 11th century by a San Franciscan monk. His name was, his name was Alexander Ladle, and the reason that they invented them is because back in those days, everybody drank beer, but they drank it out of barrels, and the only thing that they could use to drink beer out of these barrels was spoons, so all of them would gather around the barrels and drink out of it with these spoons, but that was very inefficient. So eventually they elongated the handle and then made the bowl bigger so that they could drink more out of it. But if you notice from the timeline, like, left-handedness hadn't been invented yet, so they came up with these, which helped them drink drink more because it's got a little spout on the end of it, and it looked like it would go like this. They would put the beer in the <laughs> San Franciscans moved to California, and then, and then America was invented after that, and ladle became uh, ladle, so it's spelled like that. And then in the year 2005, uh, left-handedness was invented. And if you read on Wikipedia, you'll see that these ladles can create difficulties for left-handed users. So I want to show you a demo, which is like, so I'm left-handed, and I have to use it like this, so when I drink beer, it's like, it's very inconvenient, or I can do it like this. But it's, it's very, very difficult. Anyway, they asked for honest feedback, so I gave them my honest feedback, which was all of the ladles here are right-handed ladles. I can't use them for anything. <laughs> they were very kind, and they replaced every, every one of the ladles with ambi-handed ladles. <laughs> that made me very happy. So even though I had to talk about my feelings, there are happy endings here. There's one more happy ending that I want to share. It's between the, um, I don't know if you were at the party last night, but it was between the cutest couple that I saw at the party last night. And, ben, and I wanted to rename them like celebrity couples, so I think that their name is... <laughs> <laughs> Alright, thanks Cascadia, that's it. I'm going to continue with the... Uh,
Bugzilla. And is there a Jira one? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I haven't gotten it working at work because, God, I hate Jira. Um, <laughs> so here are some of my tickets for uh, working on Ruby. And here are some of my tickets for working uh, on Ruby Gems on GitHub. And this uh, command line tool I have, called OmniFocus, creatively, um, syncs all of these things into my OmniFocus so that I can uh, categorize and, and work on things in one place. So all of those tickets come over automatically and it fucking rules because it just works. And here you can see me running it and it scans through like a zillion projects on GitHub and then Redmine and RubyForge and it added a ticket, uh, two of them, one from RubyForge and one from GitHub. And you can see that here and it's got a link back to the original system and it just works. So if you have OmniFocus, you want this. And if you use things, I just want to put this idea out there that it's totally possible to write a things plugin for OmniFocus and make it sync to your things setup instead. And all you need to do is this. Gem Sandbox, plug in OmniFocus, OmniFocus GitHub, copy that stuff off, and you're good to go. Thank you. While we're waiting for that, my name is Lee. I work for OneHub. Um, don't need to do anything special to get this to show up on the screen, or I suck at Keynote, so. Oh, Infinity. Huh? Oh, there we go. There we go. My presentation's called Backbone JS Looks Cool. I just haven't had a chance to mess with it yet. <laughs> That's what I've been hearing from a lot of people. Who who writes a lot of JavaScript in their job in addition to Ruby? Excellent. I've found that I've been writing about 50% or more JavaScript per day. And uh, Backbone JS is awesome and it makes my life way easier. And I'm going to show you a little bit about it. Uh, what is Backbone? It is a small JavaScript library. Um, it's got minimal dependencies. It's only hard dependency is underscore.js, which I'll touch a little bit more on a little bit later. Um, optionally, it also depends on jQuery, uh, Zepto, or, uh, or sorry, jQuery or Zepto, and JSON too. And those are only if you want to serialize stuff to and from the server or if you want to do DOM manipulation. Um, what it does, it provides basic MVC on the client. Uh, what it isn't is a monolithic JavaScript framework like uh, Sprout Core or Cappuccino where you need basically total buy-in for your application. Um, so you can add it to an existing application pretty easily. You don't need to re-architect your whole entire um, app in order to use it. Um, also, it's not MVC. What? So the idea of MVC and Backbone is a little bit different. Um, than what you're probably used to with Rails. Uh, but don't let that uh, deter you. They actually um, renamed the controller section to uh, router, because um, that's basically what it does in the new version. Um, but you don't need to worry about that. Um, you can only use the parts you need. I uh, personally use the uh, collections, models, and views extensively, and I will show you what that looks like. So this probably looks pretty familiar to you. You've got uh, a paragraph tag, you've got an um, anchor with cool stuff in it, and you've got a script tag right on your page with code that does things. What are you doing? So, you know, you click this, toggles blind, whatever. So, how can we make that better? Well, what we're doing here now, instead, is creating a cool stuff view, and that's basically a backbone view object that encapsulates all of the behavior for that view. Um, and it doesn't necessarily look a whole lot better, but you start to see real dividends when you end up with lots of code in that view that are, that's manipulating different DOM elements and you don't exactly know, you know where the code lives, where to go to in each one of your partials in order to actually edit it. So where did the code go? So what we do is we create a cool stuff view that's a backbone, backbone view object. And um, this events object gives us a uh, nice little shorthand for defining um, uh, observable events. So if you uh, define click cool stuff, and then uh, the second part of that uh, uh, key value is show cool stuff, that's actually going to automatically bind a click event on something that matches that selector to my method show cool stuff right here. 
Um, and you'll also notice that I've got this dot dollar sign. You get a nice little convenience method, uh, which is a scoped jQuery or Zepto sele uh, selector. So, um, you know, if, if you've got a bunch of reusable uh, um, templates, you can name things with classes and it makes things a lot easier to deal with. Uh, why is that better? So, like I said, the benefits stack up. You've got lots of view code. You know where your code lives and it's cacheable. So, we use Jamit, which is a really great tool. Um, they're also, you know, putting sprockets in Rails 3.1, so that's going to be great. Uh, this is our assets.yaml file. Basically, all of these files end up getting concatenated when they go to the server. Um, the user uh, downloads files.js. It can live on a CDN close to them. It can, you know, we can set far future expires on it. They cache it forever. And their pages are a lot lighter. They only have to pull in what they need. Um, so there's also models and collections. They allow you to keep your model state separate. Um, fetch and push state from the server. And uh, when you set things and get things, it emits handy events. So here's a widget model. Um, I've bound change name event to a method called change name. And right underneath here, we create a new widget. We set its name to bar. And like magic, we get a little uh, console output that tells us the name is now bar. Um, so let's see. We're doing this in our view now. We've actually created a widget in our view. And when someone actually changes the name of widget, or, yeah, so when someone changes the widget name, uh, something actually happens in our view, so we can change the representation on the view. Uh, and to show you what that actually looks like, excuse me, um, we're using this in our OneHub application. So we've got this uh, link indicator right here, and I've enabled the link. If I click disable right here, you'll notice that this guy goes away. And what it actually did was it pushed something up to the server that, uh, that serialize the state and everything, and also I'm able to reflect that in different parts of my interface. And it makes doing stuff like that super, super easy. Um, you can see, again, right here, I've got this button in two different places, and it gets reflected in both of these places with almost no effort on my part. So that's cool. Um, let me my keynote again. All right, time. All right, other cool stuff, collections can emit events, views can render themselves, models can easily sync with the server. Also, underscore.js is awesome, and uh, you get that for free. Try it, you'll like it. Thanks. <laughs> show some of the features real quick. A uh, quick example of this, uh, first, uh, here's a built-in button. And here's a built-in list view that they have. Uh, don't worry, I'll show you to this in a second. Uh, here's their built-in collapsible feature. You can just click things, have them show up. Um, it has, uh, it's built off of a lot of ideas that jQuery UI has, and so you can use its theme roller capabilities. I tend to like this theme right here because it's yellow and shiny. It also has other things in it. Um, many of its form elements in it that are built in and set for touch UI interfaces, so it's not uh, set for clicking like normal. So you can use things like the slider. All right, so. It's not all that impressive to see that stuff. But let's see. Uh, all right. So that first page, um, the first couple of pages put together here are uh, just a matter of saying bigger font. Better. Bigger. <laughs> 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 Data roll button. So I just throw a data roll button on a link and it automatically creates that button element for me. Um, at that point, I don't have to worry about writing the styling for it uh, and it fits. It fits any page and that you put it on. It will fit on any type of, well, a majority of good mobile browsers out there. Anything from iOS to Android, um, Opera Mini, Blackberry, even Blackberry. Um, if you'd like to do something like the list, that I was showing, uh, you just put that you want. 
did a roll list view, and it sets it up. If you want it to be inset, like mine was, where it gives the borders around it, data inset equals true. If you don't want that, if you want a far stretching side, you just take that away. Uh, you put anchors on the links, and it will give the indication that it is a clickable item. For a theming, you just put what theme you'd like. It has, it, as I said before, it has something like jQuery UI's uh, uh, theme roller set up, so you can set up to 26 different themes that you would like for your elements and for your attributes. Um, you know, sit down, talk with the designer, write out everything you'd like, and then you can just throw data theme equals certain letter that you set up for it. It will automatically know where to go in the CSS when it draws the page to grab that. Um, in order to set up that uh, little slider, it's just a data roll of field contain, and then you just throw in the range input type. And in order to create a dialogue pop up kind of thing, I just put data rail dialogue on a link, and that doesn't change the hash. Because this is all set up in hash navigation. Um, the interesting highlights, um, and the things that worked on, and it worked on, blah, blah, blah. Um, the interesting highlights are that every you have the ability to DOM cache any page that you bring up. So if you cache a page right there, um, and then you go back to it several times over, which I like to do with any pages that have static content on them, uh, from that point forward, you will be able to access that page without having a request to your back end. Severe, severe speed increase. Um, that is going to be a feature that is selectable soon because right now that is something that they force on all pages and it's kind of a cache all the things thing. And I made something recently where uh, it had you know 70 something route or routes to it and took down the app after it had 70 pages cached on the DOM. But, um, there's a lot to talk about with it. The GitHub page uh, and where the project is. They have an actual page itself. Um, I live in the IRC room for it. I have submitted several bugs and talked about and worked on the project quite a bit um, and hacked my own versions of it. If you have any questions about it, come and find me. I'm around. Thanks. Everyone here who uses Ruby, there's a good chance you're going to be on the web at some point. And there's some people here I was talking to that uh, were a bit interested in site monitoring. So there's basic types of site monitoring, uptime, server issues, software issues, performance. We're going to talk about the top ones. Uh, performance, you need to use something like your logs or your new So. You know, the uptime is, can you reach the site, do they get error pages, um, is it timing up? And the best way to monitor this is external services, site uptime is fantastic, it'll SMS you, it'll email you, ping them. Unfortunately, you know, you can also have customers telling you. <laughs> so, um, one thing you have to be careful of is when you choose the monitoring page, uh, we don't always want to use the landing page because we have some customers who have landing pages that pull multiple RSS feeds, they take 30 seconds to render. They're pulling in sports scores, they're pulling in Twitter feeds. If you have a site monitor hitting that, um, it can be very expensive and you can actually deny the service your own you know, startup website because <laughs> you're monitoring it. So, and you should also be caching your landing page. Um, so you have to you know, double check the pay you put in is not being cached. Um, you have to remember that there's going to be a load balancer, so Pingdom actually will ping, um, and if it gets a 500, it'll ping again, and uh, if it gets two in a row, it'll signal you. So it's, you know, you might have a problem with the load balancer, so if you get an alert, you want to look into it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, things with uh, external feeds, RSS, um, authorization, people use Facebook Connect or the LinkedIn, if those sites go down, they can sometimes interfere. It's not your site that's having the problem, it's an external one. So one of the things we recommend is something that Corey wrote, uh, Twitter Happier, which is basically 
install it. Um, there's also an uh, engineering version, and we have a little doc on it. But if you're not using Rails, uh, that's fine. We love that. Right? Camping. Who here uses camping? Just you know, a couple lines, boom, something simple. Uh, remember that a lot of these uh, site uptime tools use head, so you have to have a special case. Head shouldn't return anything, otherwise, rack will blow up in your face. Uh, so, not track, you know, same thing as well. So, um, you can have errors in your code, uh, missing migrations, locked databases, server issues, external network issues, etc. Track there. And you want some way to catch this. You do not, like I mentioned, want to monitor anything that uses third-party APIs, but you sometimes want to set up uh, monitors for those APIs externally, like maybe hit Facebook or hit the API for LinkedIn, because you want to know when something you're relying on goes down, so that you know if people start calling up, you can say, "Oh, okay, it's because Facebook's down. You know, the world's ended, but you'll be better." <laughs> um, so. I know a lot of you guys work for companies with beautiful websites and corporate identities, um, and they make their custom 500 pages. Well, make sure they do not make a custom 500 page. You do not want to have a single 500 page. You want to have multiple 500 pages so that you can show something if there's a server error, so you know it's an application, if uh, the server is unavailable, if you're doing a deploy, maintenance, um, if there's a bad gateway. That means the web server is going, but the Rails app behind it is stuck, blocked, or something like that. Um, and uh, the timeout, uh, again, or sorry, the bad gateway that the Rails app is down, and the bad gateway that it's stuck. And so you can do something like, you know, you have your page, and then for, you know, 502, have it a different color. When customers fill up, you can say, we have an error page, what color is it? Or, you know, what does it say? It still looks nicer than you know having a big you know app uh, gate with timeout or whatever. But if you can get the customer to send you a screenshot uh, with the URL, it makes debugging this a lot easier, right? Because there's so many different causes for a site to go down. So I mean, there's a lot of gray areas that you have to watch out for. So one of the things that you'll also run into is that you go to a site, it's up. Other people go to the site, it's down. So there are a few services on the web you can go to, type in your domain name, and they'll hit it from a few different locations. You just saw the presentation in reverse. Hello. I thought no conferences complete unless I guilt you about documentation. <laughs> no, no conference is complete. I've learned this now, this year, going to presentations. Um, tests are documentation. We say that a lot, and Wikipedia even says that. I noticed that, of course, you know, minutes before preparing the slides, I thought, I'll go to Wikipedia to make me sound more intelligent. <laughs> and it helped. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, these characteristics can kind of yada yada, right? So our, our tests are documentation. But our tests are not in our documentation, not at all. And it says again, if you read a little further on Wikipedia, you could, if you didn't click on the first link, and you're now reading a little further, which I always click on the first link and go down the rabbit hole, but their narrative documentation is more susceptible to dripping. So like all that stuff that you write above and document, that's wonderful. But what about the tests that we're writing? But the tests, again, that we write are not in our documentation. We have some cool documentation tools. I use. Uh, Yard, thanks to a friend that pointed out to me a while back. And I started learning how to do some templating for it and things like that. But I noticed again, like, when the documentation tool starts going, it doesn't include any of my tests into my documentation. It's like it just keeps on driving past. It says I can't, I can't pull in this documentation for you. Let me give you a little side hack here to Ruby. Um, I'm a quality assurance, or I was a quality assurance engineer, and then I became an SDED, and I started working on this Cucumber test suite to test this Java Rails application. And so I started dealing with a lot of Cucumber test suites and features and all these things, and it became really hard to deal with. But what was really cool about it was presenting documentation for product owners, like the idea that I'm writing tests and then other people can see them. But the problem is Cucumber, those guys, they thought, 
okay, product owners are going to use VI to write the features or to view them? Right? Are they going to check out from the repository? I don't know if they thought that through. I still haven't thought that, I don't know if they thought it through. Some guys did. If you check out relishapp.com or relishapp.org, I can't remember, there's a few guys that are trying to set up a website so people can push their features and show them up on the web. Uh, what I started working on shortly after kind of building this huge test framework, this feature set, was uh, a Yard plugin for Cucumber. So it pulls in all your feature files, it'll actually map them all to like your step definitions, and you can actually visualize your features that you've written. So you even get things like uh, the step definitions, the transforms that they're using, uh, you get searching by tag, searching by filter, searching by steps, step definitions, all these things that are normally there in like the upper right hand corner. You can remove a few things, those are a little extreme, like I wouldn't use all these things. Check, check it out if you're using it. It saved this one guy's life when I talked to him at a conference before. And if you have any suggestions, I'll totally add them. I, I've kind of left the project because I left the company, but uh, anyways. So I started playing with RSpec as well to say like, can I pull that into documentation? I thought, man, this is awesome, look at this, I can write a spec. And it sits there right next to the actually method decorator declaration. Like, look, that's really cool. It says it should be a pig, and then it shows an example. That's like a living, breathing example sitting right next to it. I even play with even pulling in test results. So, it isn't finished, but I got the idea that some tests are in the documentation, so I brought some of the stuff in there, and I thought that was cool. And I would really love if other people like this idea to help out with it. Like, shouldn't we have more test frameworks be parsed and then pulled into the documentation and merged in such a way? And uh, if that's cool, I'd love to talk about it more. Maybe this is a bad idea, maybe it's a good idea. But I'd love to talk about it, because I just thought of this idea when I started working that way, just thinking about product owners, and then I thought, wow, I'm using code too. I'd like to see documentation that's actually the tests. Then I thought, whoa, there's also other files that we use that are really cool that I'd love to see some documentation for. So I even went further with that. Oh, wrong picture. Um, uh, so I started playing with even like a bundler plugin that would actually show uh, your gem file, and it would actually parse it and pull it into your dar yard documentation. Um, I even pulled in like a little graphic image so you can actually see the visualization. I thought that'd be kind of cool, though the image is really wide. Uh, but it also pulled in like your gems, it gives you links to like your version numbers, your documentation, the project on GitHub, some last few commits, even like issues that are perhaps open for the project and stuff like that. I mean, they're static, but the idea was I thought, bring more stuff into documentation. So really, I think we should move anything like into documentation, anything at all. And if you guys think that's a good idea, I'd love to talk about it more and maybe help out if you have some ideas. So, thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonan. And sometimes, my slides pop up here. Sometimes I pretend to be Leapbot on the internet because I. I'm a little bit ironical and definitely anonymous, don't tell anybody, this is top secret, but that's my website, uh, leadbot.com. I am going to talk to you guys today about something that you probably know already, uh, you're all going to die. Uh, eventually, perhaps not by Jonan, the presentation is by Jonan, but I am not actually going to bring about Jonan, I promise you. Uh, in fact, if you believe this gentleman here, this is Ray Kurzweil, for those of you who don't know, uh, it turns out that we will all be Cylons someday. Uh, he has these pills available for sale on his website. These are Cylon pills. If you take them, you will live long enough to become a Cylon. Um, but that is neither here nor there. Assuming that you sit for a living, it is most likely that this very large and ominous black monster is going to come and kill you. Uh, this is part of an infographic that some of you may have seen. Somebody posted it to our campfire one day. Uh, and I read through it because I just love statistics. They're always 100% true. <laughs> And this is a good example. So, I'm going to explain to you uh, the exact nature of this, this monster here today. Uh, sitting increases your risk of death by up to 40%. Uh, if you sit six hours per day, you're 40% likelier to die within 15 years than someone else who sits for three hours or less a day. Uh, this doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you are an ultra marathoner and you run 100 mile marathons over mountaintops. Even people with vigorous physical activity outside of work who sit greater than, uh, than three hours a day have a uh, double, effectively, risk of, of cardiac injury. Um, sitting makes us big boned. Uh, I myself was not always as uh, svelte as I am today. And uh, this is an example of where that came from, that obesity doubled. Uh, exercise rates roughly stayed the same between 1980 and 2000. 
and you could attribute some of that perhaps to diet or something else, but like I said, statistics are always fact, um, and sitting time increased by 8%, therefore we have found the cause. Um, <laughs> so, how sitting wrecks your body? Uh, the electrical activity in your leg muscles shuts off. Your legs stop functioning, the muscles quit working. Your calorie burn for your entire body goes down to one calorie per minute, which is incredibly low. I'll explain a little bit more, we'll go back to the chart in a second. Uh, after two hours, your good cholesterol drops by 20%. Over here you see that people, this is the hand of the ominous black monster, people with sitting jobs have twice the rate of cardiovascular disease. Uh, you are twice as likely to die if you sit before you're living. Uh, your insulin effectiveness drops for 24% and risk of diabetes rises if you sit for 24 hours straight, uh, like that one time you drank all that jolt in college. <laughs> this is me sitting. I do not look happy. I used to have hair, and this one time I had cornrows, and then I cut it all off and gave it away. But this is my office. I work at G5 in Bend, Oregon, and this is... Uh, from Luke's perspective, Luke Sheridan over here sits opposite me, took this photo for me. This is when I was sitting and looking angry. I was mostly just posing with my bad ass hairdo, but this is me standing, which is a good mediocre solution to the problem, right? If you go to a standing desk, you're not sitting, and it is significantly better for you, actually, uh, to stand than to sit. This is a walking desk of my own design. I bought a treadmill, and I took it apart, and I put the base of the treadmill underneath my desk, and I put this huge wonky control panel on top of my desk. It turns out that this is about 90% plastic and metal, uh, and 10% electronics, if that. So I ended up taking apart all of the metal and the plastic bits, and now I just have the control panel up on my desk, and it's quite handy. Um, this is the chart that I wanted to go back to, that standing, you can increase your energy burn uh, by a small amount, slightly less than chewing gum. So if you sit and you're considering standing, get some gum instead. Uh, another good option is to walk, right? So that really climbing stairs is about as good as it gets for cardiovascular uh, exercise. They discovered that if you really want to get some good exercise, run up and down a staircase a couple times, that's hard, right? We all know that. So walking is pretty close to that hard, but it really doesn't strain you in the same way. I, I invite you to try and code running up and down stairs. I think it is less likely that you'll be successful. Um, so these are treadmill desks, and you can purchase these at walkandcode.com. It's just an arbitrary site. I am not affiliated. Uh, this I liked because they had the pairing version, so... <laughs> And the problem, of course, is that these are very, very expensive, and I am very poor. So what I did instead was I built my own. Uh, and if I can actually get out of here for just a second, I will show you on my video. That's me. <laughs> and I'm walking on my desk with my fan. Yes. Very walky of me. And then I should not have done that. Uh, oh, I'm done. That's me. Go to leapot.com. Thank you. I don't know if I could have asked for a better intro than that. Uh, talking about mechanics with immense uh, small lung repair programming appeal. So I had the luxury of hearing uh, for about the past five years. Uh, I don't actually work at Hatchback anymore. It's a whole slot deck. Deal with it. Uh, <laughs> so two developers uh, literally sitting side by side, one piece of software at the same computer. That's what pair programming is, right? Eh, mostly. Uh, so, what it is today is uh, something more akin to two developers actively, consciously collaborating to develop a piece of software at the same time. And the reason I say that is because there are slow transitions in my slide deck, but uh, it can be one developer and his rubber duck. This is actually surprisingly uh, useful if you have some sort of token that you can talk to and get the idea out of your head, it works. It's crazy. Uh, two developers, one keyboard, one mouse, no cups. Um, you can <laughs> drive navigator style. Uh, two developers, two keyboards, two mice, and a shared display. This is what I've done most often. And two developers, two machines, and a network connection uh, actually works out really well. Remote pair programming. <laughs> so you need some sort of token, it can be a, a living, breathing token. Uh, so this is uh, two developers, one machine. 
two developers, one machine, and beer. Uh, <laughs> three developers. So there, there is a rate of return uh, that falls off eventually. Uh, we tried four or five at one time. Not so much. So uh, we were always a big fan at Hash Rocket of everyone together, everybody pairing, uh, you know, two humans live sitting side by side. Uh, but then I wanted to go on vacation. And uh, I wanted to go up to Wisconsin, which turned out to be a long-term thing, whatever. Uh, we did some remote configurations. So what we needed were access to the view uh, changes in real time, the ability for either developer to edit the code, and the ability to communicate audio at least. Try to chat or screen sharing. Uh, get to see exactly what the other person sees. Uh, high bandwidth requirements, screen lag, no ability to share video, team viewer. Get to see exactly what the other person sees. High bandwidth requirements, not free. So. Downsides, pluses, uh, I'm running low on power. Can you guys see my mouse there? Yeah. Go quick. I'm going. <laughs> Keynote wants me to know I'm running low on power. Thank you, Keynote.